Callan Finney is a photographer, philanthropist, and lover of people. She is genuinely one of the kindest, most open people I have ever had the chance to talk to, and she was kind enough to discuss religion, homelessness, single motherhood, service, photography, art, beauty, charity, and accommodated whatever else my sleep-deprived mind came up with. I dearly hope you will join me as we step into her studio and meet Callan Finney. I, I'll, I won't have you flossing on camera. <laughs> I don't care using my hair, whatever. <laughs> That's express permission. I now, I'm now legally allowed to use it. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm here with uh, Callan Finney. Is that how you'd say it? Yeah. 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 And uh, she's a photographer here in Tyler, and uh, Dots are recommended her, and I've interviewed a couple of her recommendations, and they've always been good, so I thought we'd have a conversation with her. Sweet. Find out uh, how she got into photography, what the road leading to there was, and uh, so I'll let you introduce yourself a little okay, bit. Okay. Um, I'm Callanth Finney, and... Um, I'm originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I moved here in uh, the spring of 2001, 2001. so that's, uh, what, 21 and a half years ago? Yeah, let's see. I was born in Is 99, that right? yeah. so... Yeah. yeah, 21 and a half years ago. Um, <laughs> to work with... A, to, I came here for what was supposed to be about six months to to uh, work with a nonprofit organization. I was going through a training with Youth with a Mission, and um, and I was a single mother, and um, uh, it turned into well, twenty one and a half years now. I'm still here, yeah. <laughs> and I, I ended up I ended up um, going on staff with the organization that I was tra- training under. Which was not, you know, necessarily part of my plan, but I ended up staying here in Texas and met my husband, and we married in 2002, and then had another child in 2005, and so, yeah, and and uh, and I always did photography as a hobby and then to supplement our income on the side because we were full-time nonprofit humanitarian workers who lived on support and we weren't into fundraising so we lived off of just very small amount few few hundred dollars a month and Mm -hmm. then would do odd jobs to supplement our income so so you 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 kind of jumped in in what I think is going to end up the middle of the story Okay. So, all right. All right. So, uh, okay. So you want me to introduce you, myself again? No. No. Okay. I'm, okay. No. I'm saying like you know this is we're oh. we're writing a novel here. Okay, we okay, don't have to sweet. start at the beginning. Okay. All this right, is all Pulp right. Fiction. Okay. Nice. So, <laughs> so you you mentioned you came here and staying here wasn't the plan. Mm-hmm. So what was the plan? Because I I want to know how people okay. get where they are. Okay. So my plan I I honestly didn't have. A full plan. I've never had much of a plan my whole life. I'm really about like, what am I doing right now? And is this where I want to be? Or do I want to do something else? So I was coming here and then I was going to return to Minnesota. And I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do, but I knew I wanted to be a nonprofit. And so my original thought was that perhaps I would go to Chicago, which was just a neighboring city in in a in a neighboring state, well, Illinois. So, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna say that again. <laughs> What's the geography of America? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wait, is it next door or is it after Wisconsin? Okay. Anyway, I was thinking I might go to Chicago and and work uh, and live full time at Jesus People USA. Jesus People USA it was a um, it started in the 70s and they it was an organization that bought two like I don't know 150 year old high rise hotels mm. and then all of their volunteers would live in these high rise high rise hotels and take a vow of poverty um, and serve the homeless. Yeah, 
So, so how did you get first interested in that? Where did you decide that was going to be, at that time at least, your calling? <clears throat> I went to, so I was working as a hairdresser with photography as my hobby mm-hmm. in the 90s. And, and I became a Christian in 1996. Um, I wasn't raised Christian Really, I wasn't, you know, raised in church or anything. And um, so that happened, and I really wanted to live my life in service Mm -hmm. somehow. Uh, So I uh, sold everything I had, and I I went to a training program for Youth with a Mission in Minnesota. And one of the areas of service was going to volunteer at Jesus People USA in Chicago, Loved it and thought that perhaps that's where I would return, but I wanted to finish another another training program uh, that followed the last one I did, and I, I came to Tyler to do that one, or Lindale, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So you come to Lindale, so where does it go from there? Uh... I came to Lindale and I started volunteering at uh, this huge, like, 12,000 square foot maternity home for mostly teen moms. Yeah. And I loved it there and just kind of felt like, this is where I'm going to be. This is where I'm going to stay. And it was a great campus for children for families, and of course, I had this five-year-old child, and I decided to stay, and I loved it. And um, and then I met my husband, who was working in the same organization, and we stayed working there for several years, like fourteen years, I think. And uh, was it fourteen? I he he. He moved from that to to working another job, maybe after twelve years. But uh, and then I stayed a while, um, and I did photography to to supplement our income. Mm-hmm. But after a while, it just felt like it was time to move on, a new chapter of life, and um, we really needed to make some money <laughs> as well, <laughs> and. Uh, so I I opened the studio. So I started I started my business 15 years ago, but then uh, nearly eight years ago, I, well in January it'll be eight years. Mm. I found this space on the square and talked to the landlord and asked him. You know they were they were about to remodel it, and I said, Hey, would you be willing to not remodel it and and rent it out it. to me for a yeah. photography studio. And he said, okay. And we we signed papers, signed a lease within, you know, a day or two. Yeah. And moved in. And it's it's worked out really well. That's so, great. Yeah. So just just wondering, because besides money, like, what, what was it that made you feel like it, it's time to move on? Like, what, was there a, any events or anything? Or was it just... No, it really was just... It was it was two, it was two parts. So my husband had moved on, and we really needed to make money for our family. It started to feel irresponsible. Yeah. That either we were going to need to do some serious fundraising and asking people to give us money, or we were going to need to get jobs where we could be paid money. Mm-hmm. And my husband was offered a position at our church, which is. Uh, Christ Church Episcopal, and um, so he he took a job as the college minister and um, and music director at, uh, for our the the Epiphany Community, which was the the upstairs yeah. in the church, the fourth floor. We outgrew that and had to move into a, a totally new building, but we're still with with Christ Church Episcopal. Um. And so he did that, and and something that was neat about being in YWAM was that we were in it together, and it was really our life together, and now our lives were 
very separate where I was still doing this and he was now in the real world. Yeah. And, uh, and I really wanted to do more alongside him. I wanted to help with our college group. I, I, I really felt like we needed to, we needed to make money. We were going into debt, working for free, yeah. you know, and, um, uh, and my business had been growing without my trying really, you know, just, yeah. I started doing it for free. And then I started saying, all right, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do it for a donation, whatever you can afford. And then I say, okay, I'll do it a minimum $50 donation. <laughs> and then the demand, as the demand grew, I would say, okay, it's a hundred dollars, but if you yeah. can't afford it, that's okay. You know? Yeah. And it, and it kept growing and, so much that I ended up having to, I outgrew my house and needed so to get a So you were just studio. doing it out of your house at that time? I was doing it out of the house, yeah. And, which is just a mile down the road. And opened the studio and I thought, well, this could totally be a flop. Um, you know, I was, I don't know, I was maybe making like 20000 a year Yeah. at the time. And, well, my rent was not much less than that. So I thought, well, it's, um, you know, worst case scenario, uh, we just become dirt poor and we, we have to go live at the Salvation Army. Okay, that's the worst case scenario. And I thought, but that wouldn't be so bad. You know, we would just, we move in there and make the best of it and probably have the opportunity to build relationships with people who, who, uh, maybe we could, we could love and influence and, you know, but it worked. It, it totally worked. Um, it took off and my clientele grew and I raised my prices and, and only a portion of my, of, of my clientele stayed with me through raising my prices. But then, uh, then, you know, eventually you, you uh, you draw a, a new demographic, yeah, and you learn and you get better and you raise your prices again. So here we are, eight years after that decision, and and uh, and I'm doing really well. So, so I I, I want to know because uh, you mentioned you know it's always been kind of like a side gig, mm-hmm. hobby sort of thing. So what's the genesis of that? When did you first? pick up a camera when did you decide that's gonna be your I got, thing I got my first I, I always wanted to I was always interested in photography but back in the 90s it really felt like in order to be a photographer you would have to have a degree and I was a single mother and I was poor and so it never entered my mind that perhaps I could do this for a living I just felt like that was not ever going to be an option, but I, but it seemed so fun that I, I just wanted to experiment and, and have fun with it. So I got my first real camera, <laughs> my first, uh, SLR camera, film, yeah. film SLR camera in 1995, it was February of 1995. I was pregnant and traveling across the country to go see the Grateful Dead <laughs> in uh, Oakland, California. And, and I decided that would be a good time. I was going to go on this road trip with uh, a bunch of friends, see the Grateful Dead. This would be a great time to, to start my, my new hobby with, my, with, my, uh, with a good camera. So I went... Went to the camera store and I asked, I, I told the guy what I wanted to do and I said, which camera should I get? And and he pointed one out and I said, well, can you show me how to use it? <laughs> and he gave me a little lesson, just enough to know how to use it a little bit. Yeah. Didn't know anything about aperture or, uh, I, knew, I knew a little bit about film speed and that was it. I didn't know anything about aperture or, uh, or shutter speed. Yeah. I just knew about um film speed and 
and that when you look in it, the little light meter, it needs to be green, and that tells you if you're good to go. And <laughs> so, so, so what, what, what was the first camera? It was you know? a, a Rico or a Rico. I have it sitting out there on the piano, actually. Um, and I used that for a long time, and, and it broke. And I still kept using it. There, there were cracks in it, and there were light leaks, and and all the all the images were really foggy. No, those but are I just, I just the kept, effects, right? Still kept, still kept <laughs> using it. Yeah. And, uh, and before that, I I would um, I had a point and shoot in high school, and I would take pictures of my friends, and I'd go get them developed, and then I would cut everybody out of the pictures and then I would go through magazines and I'd cut out magazine pages like like an ocean or a car or a something and I'd cut out different things and glue it onto a page and then glue the pieces of my photos onto it to make a whole scene yeah. So it was like Photoshop. Sort of. Uh, before Photoshop was a thing. Uh, pop art kind of. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah. really, I would try to make a scene. Like, I, you know, I remember taking a, it was a Bacardi ad. So it was, you know, a bottle of, a, a clear bottle of rum. And I, I put my friend, so it looked like she was inside the bottle. And it was floating on the water. And another friend was standing in the water. And... So yeah. I, you know, make these, make these, these scenes. And, um, and then I would go to the copy play, you know, the copy Xerox store and, and, uh, color copies were a new discover discovery for me at that time. So <laughs> I would get a bunch of color copies of it and hand them out to my friends. Yeah. And, um, and that was what really kind of sparked my my love for the hobby. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned the Grateful Dead and that's 95. Was that the last year with, uh, it was the last tour with Jerry Garcia. Jerry Garcia. Yes. Yeah. So he died in, um, I think it was in 90, August was of it? 95. Really? Yeah. 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 That's what I was thinking. I was like, I, it's going to be 95 or 96. So, yeah, yeah. It was August, early, early August. Um, and uh, how was the show, or do you remember it? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I do, I do. I mean, I was pregnant, so I was fairly so be- uh, best not to. I was fairly do all the normal was, great right. Dead. Yeah, I wasn't doing any LSD that day. Uh, well, not not any time during my pregnancy. Yeah, before my pregnancy, I did plenty. <laughs> um, and uh, so. Um, yeah, it was, it was good. It was interesting. It was, I was a little perplexed by the craze, you know? I was like, I mean, yeah, it's good music. Yeah. But like, these people are freaking out. They're fanatics. You know, like I went with, I went with a car full of my friends and they were were, like. Were you like a a fan before or kind of a casual? Very casual. Like I lived with three I lived with three other girls and they were super into the dead deadheads. <laughs> and I was always sort of, if any of my, if my friends were super into something, that was a, uh, a guarantee that I would not be into that same thing. You know, I just, yeah. if it was, if it was, li- if it was too well liked, then I, you know, didn't want to like it. Wanted to be the So yeah. So I was yeah. like, but I was more into the adventure part of it. Road yeah. trip. Okay. Yeah, I'll go see the Grateful Dead. That's fine, you know. We listened to it in the house, but I, I was always like, "Oh, come on, it's not that great." Um, <laughs> but, but it was fun. I was more excited about the parking lot scene and the social aspect of the Dead show than I was actually <clears throat> seeing the music. Yeah, the kind of carnival um, that built itself around them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. That's what I was most excited for. In fact, I bought tickets for two nights and then you know there's all these people out in the parking lot that that they hold up signs saying miracle me 
and miracling somebody is giving them a free ticket to the show. Yeah. So they come, they're broke, they don't have a ticket to the show, and they so some people would buy tickets just to miracle somebody. Well, I learned about that, and I thought, well, that'd be fun. That'd be real fun to make somebody's day. And yeah. you know, I'm more excited about this, like this parking lot situation than the show. <laughs> like, I saw, you know, I'm, I I saw the show. Maybe yeah. I could just skip the next one. Skip the one, you know, that was happening the next day. And uh, so I gave that other ticket away, and that was really fun because just you know, see somebody get real excited, and um, yeah. So let, let's bring it back to uh, the 2010s here for a while. Okay. And get out the uh, 60s and then the resurgence of the 90s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, y- you're, you say that, you know, every time your clientele would change, every yeah. time you had to raise. Like, h- how did you keep from getting discouraged by that? Or was it like an immediate, like, this clientele's out, but I have these new people in? Yeah, it felt like... I would get a little discouraged because I'm such a people person and I really connect with with folks. And so uh, when I would see that a client went somewhere else and used another photographer, I'd feel a little bit sad. And, well, I guess I won't be seeing them anymore. Um, But financially, it it wasn't as much of an issue because – because I'd get calls and people would actually pay my new prices and I couldn't believe it. I felt – a little bit like I was stealing from them. You know, mm. I can't believe they're actually going to pay me what I asked. <laughs> but they did. Oh, my gosh. This month was great. And I don't know at what point it changed, but I remember thinking every month, I probably won't do this well next month, but this is great right now. And I always had a little bit of anxiety. When I, when I started getting used to the money every month, I'd get a little anxiety feeling like, there's no way I'm going to make this next month. There's, I don't even have anything booked. What if I don't make anything next month? Yeah. Right. And, and it always, it just, it always happened. Yeah. And, um, so, so, uh, was everything you learned just kind of like trial and error or, uh, yeah, it was trial and error, but I also had this guy that, that went to my church in Minneapolis and he and his wife um, had a professional photography business there. And so when I came to Texas and I eventually started my business, I called him and I said, would you be willing to look at my work and, and critique it for me and tell me how it could be better? (laughs) And he was just so honest you know, yeah. he said yes, and he, but he was really hard on me. And he would pretty much just tell me why it was bad. And his wife was in the back row going, but tell her what's good about it. <laughs> you know, but I <laughs> yeah. really appreciated that. I mean, his, uh, he wasn't there to encourage me. He was there to correct me, and that's really what I wanted. I wanted somebody to tell me how I can do better. Like, thanks for the compliment, but I want to know what can be better. And... And so he worked with me for a couple of years. Yeah. And I always had something to work on. So what point, because I know there's like, you know, going from, you know, maybe you can donate, donate, donate this much Mm -hmm. to pay me. So when, when did you get that confidence to be like, okay, now I can charge people? And then now I can raise the price on people. Was there like some event that happened? Okay. Well, the main thing, uh, the main thing was that I made friends with a lot of the other photographers in town. And there was one business in specific called um, Donna Cummings Photography. And they're still in business here. And and they're a high-end portrait studio Um different um different style than than what I am but did you know had a very good business model mm-hmm. and they sort of came in and hijacked my pricing system and they said look you're really good and and low prices are not good for the industry yeah and so you need to 
you need to raise your prices to be fair to the industry. And I said, but I'm too scared. I, I can't afford to lose business. So I just, you know, I don't even know what I would, what I would ask for. So they, along with a, a girl in Jacksonville, Emily Griffin, I think was her name, they came in and, and, you know, scribbled on my pricing menus and said, this is what you need to do and help me create new pricing. And, and I did it and I was very nervous about it, but they said, you got to trust us. You're going to do, you're going to do much better and it's going to be better for the rest of us too. Yeah. And they were right. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was such a huge jump from what I had been doing that I thought I'm going to lose all my clientele. And within just a couple of months, I was working less, but making more and then started working more and making more. And every time I've, I, and then that's what gave me the courage to increase my prices, which is now what I continue to do every couple of years. I, I raise those, raise the prices again. I'll be doing it again in January and I'm just not worried about it because there are enough people that are willing to pay and the price doesn't matter as long as they're getting a quality product and I'm confident that I can give them that. Yeah. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned your style. So Mm -hmm. Every photographer's got their own style and stuff. So I want to know, what would you say your style is and how did you come to that process of developing it? It's really hard for me to explain my style. Um, I don't know how to describe it, but I recognize it when Mm. I see it in other images. Like, I know what I like. I know what I'm going for. I know what type of lighting... Um, not only appeals to me, but I believe goes along with what the image is trying to communicate or what we're trying to communicate through the image. I love commercial photography. That's become uh, about 80% of everything we do here in the studio. And that was very organic how that happened. But I really, I really like it. So do do you like the kind of graphic design aspect of that or (laughs) what what is it about? No, I really like being able to communicate a brand through imagery. Yeah. So communicating, um, you know, I'll, I'll, being able to create what people would normally purchase as a stock image being able to create something like that, but but by using the company's people, their environment, mm. their brand, and being able to communicate that, learning about their business and what it is that they want to communicate, what it is that they want to use to draw people in, what they do, what they have to offer, and how can we communicate those things through imagery. Yeah. And it's a fun challenge for me, and, and I'm really good at it. So we all like something that we're good at, you know? Yeah. So so just I, I have this image of my, in my head of uh, the uh, collages you talked about. Mm-hmm. Do you incorporate that into your work, or is there some aspect of that that's kind of creativity still there? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, absolutely. Everything I do is fairly realistic, whereas cutting out bottles of Bacardi and having people float on the water is not realistic. (laughs) It's a little bit more Uh, in the... uh, So, so yeah, I I use that part of my brain um, and the same type of creativity to communicate things and to create images, but not in a way where it's obvious that they were manipulated or photoshopped. It just looks very realistic. Yeah. So so I'm trying to think how to describe this. I have okay. ideas in my head and then I can't speak them, which is bad for a person who does audio. <laughs> <laughs> uh 
<laughs> so like, like this room itself yeah. has a sort certain flow to it. Yeah. And I guess you'd say it's realistic, but there's definitely a style to it. It's not necessarily like it, it's not necessarily just the average waiting room or sitting room sure. or something. So d- does the is that part of it kind of building that world like part of your photography? Because um, like yes, th- this not- room, this room isn't part of the regular world. This is separate from it. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, Does that but make I wouldn't any sense? say I wouldn't say that my photography necessarily ref- reflects the vibe of my studio. Mm-hmm. But the way that I've built the environment, the ambiance of the space is similar to how I would build my images. I, I rarely start with, I know what I'm going to do mm-hmm. on anything. I start with, let's try this. Mm. That's been the theme so far. Let's change that. Yes, I like that. Oh, what would look good with that? You know, building. It's about building mm-hmm. and creating. So I don't have a formula. So so that that is I think that's the collage aspect we yes. talked about earlier. You've got it. Yes. Maybe it's not the surrealism of it, but it's that building up from there. Yes, and I'm always excited about what's going to be my next favorite image. Mhm. You know, I have no idea cuz I don't have a formula. It's so, not So so how better. how often do you have a favorite image and how long do they stay? Gosh, I don't know. That's I've never thought about it. Hmm. Maybe, maybe once every couple months. Yeah. You know, I'll go. This is like wow. This is so good. I never would have imagined this image, right? Um, but, but creating and building, you're always learning new things about your environment, learning new things about your own brain. And, and then it gives you fuel for the next thing. So your, 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 your products are always getting better and more interesting. And I always have the things to fall back on, you know, if I'm having a brain fog, if I have a commercial client in who's here for a branding session and I'm having a brain fog, I have, you know, a catalog in my mind of things I can resort to. Well, yeah. this always works. This is a tried and true. Let's do this one. So, so does it usually go from that to a uh, image that you would put as your favorite? Or is that more of a spontaneous thing than the things that you normally fall back on? And I'm, I'm, I'm not like I'm trying, trying to, to grill you here. I'm no, just, I'm trying I'm to trying uh, okay, wait, say it again. Okay, so you're, t- you're talking about how you don't always know what you're going to do. So you have right. these things you fall back on. Yep. We, we kind of talked about the building block concept. So I was wondering, do, can you build on from these things that you fall back on? Or are your favorite yes. images more spontaneous than that? Like, have you ever had like a thing where you don't know what you're going to do? So you fall back on something, and then out of that comes yes. your favorite creation? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. usually how it happens. That's usually how it happens. And it doesn't happen every time. It doesn't happen every session. Yeah. You know, I could go show you 10 albums of mine right now that that of 10 different sessions. I'm making up a number, but I'm guessing. <laughs> 10 different commercial sessions that all look very similar. You know, Um but not exact, but similar. Yeah. But every once in a while, especially if I have somebody, so I have different packages. You know, I have my, my, my smallest commercial patch, package is six images. Then I have a 12 image. Then there's a 20 image. Then there's like a, a, a full day, you know. So yeah. it's always the ones that have the bigger packages Almost always the ones with the bigger packages where I come up with something new. 
yeah. because we have more time. Yeah. And it's not just about getting those six images that I go. I have Is more it? time to be creative, more time to think, and I love having lots of time. Yeah. Is it more like... I'm thinking about the building block concept stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out your creativity because that always interests me is how people come up with things. Yeah. So does that give you more time to play with it? Like I'm thinking about yeah. you with uh, your uh, words, <laughs> your, your compilations, yeah. you know, taking out these magazine parts and stuff. That, that Does giving you a day that have you more clippings to work with yeah for sure but I usually I usually create the image knowing that I'm gonna do that you know I'll see I'll see a space mm -hmm. and I'll visualize that space and I'll then I'll put the the individual or the product in that space and I'll move around and try different different angles, um, you know, different, different framing, different composition, different lighting. Um, I have my, uh, Hannah is my right hand girl here and Hannah will, Hannah's, Hannah's home taking care of her farm animals tonight because her, <laughs> her family's out of town. So she had to be home. She couldn't be here, but, uh, you know, and Hannah adds to it too. She'll say, Hey, let's try moving the light over here and reflecting off of this or, you know, we'll, we'll, we collaborate and that's really fun is to put our heads together and building off of each other. It's just a lot of fun for both of us. Um, and so we'll, most times we'll create the image in camera right there, knowing that we're going to do some manipulation yeah. in our post-production I, I guess my, my my idea wasn't really the post-production necessarily mm. my idea was more like you have this whole day to work instead this time so it gives you more time to play with the image it gives you more time to work out those little details the things you want to add right then and there yeah not necessarily in, in the post or whatever yeah 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 but it's both it's both yeah yeah so What's a good question to follow up that one? That was really good. Like I, I liked. The yeah. Back and forth. So, do you ever have an uh, image fully formed come to your mind? Like, you got to set out and create this, or is it always that building block? Yeah, there are times, but it's mostly building. Yeah. It mostly happens in the moment. Yeah, in fact, when people come and uh, it's always fun for me to say, even if it's just a, a, you know, a senior in high school whose parents bring them, mm -hmm. and they'll say, all right, what are we going to do? And I'll go, I have no idea. <laughs> and you see in their eyes going, you didn't prepare? Yeah. You know, and I love to tell them. I don't know what we're going to do, but it's going to be fun and it's going to be so great because I know that not preparing is going to give me the opportunity to use the most creative parts of my brain. And that's when I am producing things that I never would have thought of before. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, and I found that, you know, through whatever, okay, let me say that, so, so people have asked me before, tell us about your passion for photography. And I always say, photography is not my passion. My passion uh, is, is love and creativity, interaction, people, God, creating, um, all of that that's my passion. And it just so happened that because I've had several different hobbies, creative hobbies mm. that involve uh, people, that involve uh, doing things with my hands, all of that. It just so happened that photography was the one that ended up bringing in the money. Yeah. And that's the one that, that took off, right? Yeah. So if, my, if, uh, if, I, 
if I could no longer do photography tomorrow, well, that would be a big bummer because our family lives off of it, <laughs> right? Yeah. But as far as um, my attachment to it, I would just find something else. Yeah. I'd find something else to it's use the, the same uh, part of my brain, that something that would connect me to people. Um, yeah. And so anyway, that was part of something else I was going to say. Um, okay. So for example, um, whether it's painting or, or art with fabrics, I, I did a lot of art with fabric that involved sewing and and other other forms of putting fabrics together, but sewing was a big one. Um, I would create art pieces with sewing. I would create clothing pieces with with sewing, and and most times um, I would my favorite pieces were things that I made a mistake on. So perhaps I'm making a, a handbag of some kind and. I totally made a mistake on it and uh, I cut off a piece that I didn't mean to or I sewed two things together and I really didn't feel like taking out the entire seam. I just decided I'm going to go in a different direction. Those things were always my very favorite. And so I made a rule for my kids um, that – so my, especially my, my older son is an artist – and he works as a production designer in, in New York. And um, one rule, and I, I'm not a rule person, but one rule I had for him is you're never allowed to destroy a piece of art. So whether it's in your sketchbook or anything, you're not allowed to crumple up the piece of paper. You're not allowed to tear it out. I don't like that rule. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say if you make a mistake on it... Um, you can turn the page and go to the next page, but you can't mm. tear it out. But what would be even better is if you take a deep breath, look at what you just did, and think, where else can I go from here? How can I turn the direction of what I'm doing? Mm. And it really fosters creativity in a person when they allow themselves to build upon the accidental thing that happened, the mistake. Um... And, and I see pieces of God in that because I know from, from even my own life of having had, having lived a life of destruction and, and causing hurt to myself and others, that those things were never erased, but that, um, but that bringing, or giving those things over to God, that God, in God's creativity, was able to take those things and actually make something beautiful out of it instead of just wiping it out, yeah. just erasing it. And that's something that I love. I love the opportunity to create something beautiful from something that uh, seemed like it was going to be destroyed, seemed that it was that appeared to be a mistake or perhaps was a mistake, but we can make something new out of it. Just change the direction of this. Yeah. So that happens in photography too. You know, I'll say, Hey, let's try this with a client. I've got an idea. Let's try it. And so many times I'll go, Oh, that was just a terrible idea. I'm just really honest yeah. about it. Oh, that was a <laughs> flop. That wasn't at all. But let me, let's just sit here for a second. Let me think of what else I can do with this. Okay. Let's try to bring in some light over here. Actually, Actually, we're going to do this. Turn around, you know? And, yeah. and that's a lot of times when, when those great images end up coming about. So I want to ask you this. Um, do you believe that all people are creative? Okay. Um, to a point, yes. I do believe that some are more creative than others. Mm -hmm. But creativity boiled down, I would say is problem solving. Yeah. The ability to problem solve. So, so many times we think of creativity as, um, as art, that it has to be artistic. Yeah. But I don't believe that. Um, you know, um, 
manipulative people. Deceptive and manipulative people. <laughs> Very creative. Yeah. You got to have a lot of creativity. And the more that, you know, so it's like, so creativity isn't always necessarily a good thing. It can be used, it can be used for, for good and it can be used for destruction, right? So, yeah. um, uh, but then it could also, you know, it's any, any time you're able to solve a problem, be able to accomplish something by going around the regular steps, you're using creativity. Mm -hmm. so yes everybody is creative to an extent yeah and I think those of us who who have allowed ourselves to to build upon experiences to figure things out have um have more creativity because we've had to exercise it so I would say that creativity for me started um I, I was an only child in my house. Both my parents were married several times, so I had siblings, but none that were in my house mm -hmm. until uh, my baby brother was born at age 10. So I was alone. My parents were young. Um, they worked full time, and I was alone a lot. And that gave me the opportunity to be creative because, I mean, boredom boredom makes an opportunity for creativity today everybody's got you know electronics they can turn to so it's yeah. not not quite as much you know our, our options are limited because we're given so much now but back in the 80s uh you know late 70s early 80s especially there really wasn't a, we didn't have any of that and so you're you um you had your toys you had your legos you had light bright you had paper and pen and sticks and leaves and uh and i became really creative during those times then there was a time i i had a rough go as a child and as a teenager um a lot of brokenness in our house and i i eventually ended up on the street i lived um i lived on the street at, uh, I, I was on the street at age 16 and anybody you meet that has lived a life of homelessness, most of them you'll find are very creative, Yeah, you know, and resourceful. Even those that, that have, um, developmental delays mm -hmm. you're going to find have a, a um, often a higher level of creativity because of the challenges that they're facing. So, I mean, you look in dumpsters and you go, what, what's in here that maybe I could use, right? Yeah. And, um, and then, uh, or where, where am I going to sleep and how am I going to keep warm and how am I going to keep cool and how can I make it through this day and how can I make this happen and lots of creativity, um, you're having to do lots of problem solving. Then as a, as, a, um, as a young adult, I was a single mother, got pregnant, had a baby, wasn't married, was on my own, had very little resources, very little support, very little family. And so I, 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 uh, I continued to have to figure out really creative ways to uh, to make money, to find the things that I needed. And dumpster diving was a huge one for me. Mm. And I, I lived in a, in a complex with a dumpster, like every complex has. <laughs> and, um, and I would go out there, I would go out there daily and look to see what people had thrown away. And so I, I mean, I, when I got a job, I, um, I didn't have, uh, I didn't have many hangers, right? Such an yeah. easy thing to, to get, but I didn't have any many many hangers. I I didn't have a table. I did. I had a I had a coffee. T I moved into this place. I had a coffee table with three legs. I had a radio. Is it three out of four, or did it come with three legs? Three three out of four. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, three out of four. <laughs> Missing a leg. I had one folding chair. Um, I had a radio, and I had uh, a mattress. Mm -hmm. That was all I had. 
And so I built a, I built a shelves out of pieces of wood and cinder blocks that I found. Um, I built a table out of cinder blocks and a, and a slab, um, just a sitting on the floor one. Yeah. And, um, and I found artwork and, and then I, I didn't have a lot of hangers. And so my, uh, my clothes had wrinkles in them and I got a job. Well, I couldn't go to work in wrinkly clothes and I would, uh, I, I found a frying pan in the dumpster and I would just heat that up on the stove and, and use it to smooth, and use it to smooth out the wrinkles in my clothing. So I ironed my clothes with a frying pan. I was just wondering, you mentioned artwork. So yeah. I want to know kind of what the artwork was okay. and why is that important? Yeah. You mentioned um, that. Which oh, I think my, I know why it's important. Yeah, but yeah. I want to feel I want to feel happy in my environment. I want to surround myself with things that make me feel good. Mm-hmm. Um and I've always loved um I've always loved lots of color, lots of texture, um lots of, you know, I mean, I would, t- I would take fabric and strips of fabric and hang them from the windows because I loved the array of colors and, and, uh, and, and, and textures. Um, I loved the, the sound, like the more things you have on the wall, you know, it changes the sound. Yeah. I loved that. Uh, but the first piece of artwork I found was, it was a... Uh, it was a Native American and a buffalo, and they were under the moon, and and it was painted onto a piece of wood with, um, what do you call it over the top? Varnish or lacquer or, or, or something yeah. like that. But it was... Polyurethane. It, yeah, polyurethane. <laughs> there we go. There we go. It was polyurethane. <laughs> that was my first piece of art, and I didn't love it. Yeah. But I didn't hate it. And it was something. And, it was, and, uh, and that was my first piece of art. And I kept that until I found en- enough other art that, uh, that I eventually gave that one away to, some- to someone else. And I would just take, you know, a lot of times I would take a piece of art and change it, do, th- do different things to it. Um, and uh, I found a statue of a... A, tr- a tribal statue with a with a spear. I yeah. I don't know. I just yeah. Uh, yeah. And I and I found a sled. I found a sled in that dumpster, and I used that to. I didn't have a vehicle, and so I used that to to take my baby around. Um, you know, this there was a store just a couple yeah. blocks away, and we had snow. And so I would, I'd put the, uh, you know, I'd put the diaper bag and, and the baby and all the blankets and I'd, I'd, you know, wind him up so he was warm and, um, cushion him in there and I'd pull him along in the sled and go get the groceries and put the groceries in the sled and bring it back. And eventually that sled got a hole in it. Um, but I had been working, so I had enough money to buy myself a sled. <laughs> and so even my life, right, is just building upon. Yeah. And um, building upon in experiences as well and in, in learning, and I'm still learning. And So do you think that you would have been able to keep building upon that and moving on without the artwork? Oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just find some other way to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how it would have yeah. happened, but it would have happened. I was just wondering how important that was for someone who's creative to surround themselves with that. Yeah, I mean, it would have happened because I would have yeah. just taken. I would have taken leaves and sticks and and construction paper, and in fact, I did. Um, in fact, I did. I took. Uh, I found some branches outside. And some twine. And then I got some green construction paper and I created leaves. And in my, in my son's bedroom, um, I, I, hung the, I hung the branches um, from the twine. 
and put them into the corners of the wall. I don't remember what I used, if I used screws or what I used, but I, I did that and then I made little vines out of the <laughs> construction paper with the leaves and um, to, to make his, and I tried to, and so his room eventually became a jungle theme because cause I started out with these branches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just built from there. Yeah, I never said, let's make this a jungle theme. I just thought, what can I do with this stick? What can I do with this branch here? I'll do that. Yeah. What else could I do? So, yeah. So, I'm not trying to go too deep with this stuff. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, don't want you to feel like I'm grilling you. I'm just Oh, I don't care. I'm just Grill. Curious. Grill. I'm an open book. I don't I don't mind. So, what makes something beautiful? Somebody finding beauty in it. Yeah. Yeah. Whether that's the person or or somebody else. If somebody feels like there's beauty, then there is. We get to decide. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's obvious beauty in, in kindness and goodness and love and generosity and, and those types mm-hmm. of things. But, um, you know, makes me think of, have you ever been somewhere or have you ever heard a piece of music? Have you ever been shopping and you think, eh, I would have never thought that was nice or beautiful. And somebody else goes, wow, look at that. Mm-hmm. I really like the way that sounds or this is a really cool shirt or I love the way that hangs or something um and then you see it differently right and you go oh yeah yeah that's cool and the same way goes for if somebody says oh that's terrible that sounds terrible that looks so ugly and it sometimes will change our view on on that thing, right? People's yeah. opinions. Um, there's value in being able to override those things, but we are influenced by what other people think. Yeah. Especially those close to us. So, uh, I just had this thought because you were talking about how being a contrarian yeah. when you were yeah. younger. Uh-huh. Still so- kind of am. A little bit. <laughs> Yeah, but the way you're talking isn't very contrarian. It's very much, you know, if you find beauty in it. So yeah. did that change? Or is that one of those things where it's a concept you understand in your head, but maybe you don't agree with it? <laughs> hmm. Um, I think my natural bent is that if too many people like something... Then I think, why are you giving this so much attention? Yeah. Right? Like if it's like a if if it's if it's big in numbers, everybody just loves this. If I don't love it, I'm I'm probably more quick to criticize it. Yeah. Right? Then if somebody else says, um, yeah. If something, if somebody says something is ugly or not good, I am probably more quick to go, well, I can see something nice in that. Yeah. Yeah. So you just want to be, so you still are Yeah, there's are probably that. a part of me that's a little bit counterculture, a little bit uh, contrary. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just in me, I guess. Yeah. So... Trying to decide if I want to go here or not. Just so, go. Okay, I'll just go, go there. I'll go. Okay, so I was thinking about the concept, and uh, you kind of mentioned it earlier. Uh, beauty, kind of out of darkness, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you you called it a mistake or something like that. Mm. And uh, one of my favorite bands is Alice in Chains. I remember <laughs> Alice in Chains. So the the thing is, a lot of people would think you know that's so dark or whatever Mm -hmm. you've got these uh harmonies that don't really make sense when Mm -hmm. you put them down or whatever but and i mean we're talking about like deep deep drug abuse and depression and stuff but like even me as a person who hasn't 
dealt with drug abuse or something. I find yeah. something like seriously beautiful and ultimately it destroyed him or whatever but what yeah. do you think of that concept of like beauty um. out of uh darkness because uh, like like in your way i could see your story kind of as that but also throughout it i don't i don't hear you mention much darkness even in the hardest parts of well there was yeah there was. I just haven't gone there. But there was. Um, and and I don't mind. I don't mind. There's nothing I won't talk about, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm, so, I'm such an open book. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of anything. Everything that, that I've done or have been through is part of my experience, and I fully embrace it. Um, and I, and there, you know, there's so much beauty in transparency there's so much beauty in being genuine there's so much beauty in the truth um and when we try to cover when we try to cover up things like that's not truth you know Mm. it doesn't mean it's necessarily lying but there's really like there's beauty in recognizing what is uh but I don't, you know, it's hard for me to, I, I remember Alice in Chains, um, but I can't, I can't, uh, I can't draw it up, you yeah. know? Um, I'll sing a little bit for you. But like, yeah, but I mean, let me think of something else yeah. that I do remember. Um, Uh, you know what the beauty in it, the beauty in it, I would say is, um, maybe not Alice in Chains, but maybe in some I mean, other forms of art. you don't have to use my example. I'm just. Let's just take other forms of art or, or yeah. it doesn't have to be art. Just anything that's like calling out what is. There's beauty in that, in, in recognizing where a person is and being real about it. You know? Yeah. Like. There's nothing beautiful about being phony, you know? Um, So I would say that pretending to be pristine, pretending to be uh, bright and shiny and clean um, is far less beautiful than being honest about darkness. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay. Keep going if you want. To. I don't know what <laughs> I else don't to say. Stop. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I I get with certain people. I want. Uh, I don't know. I I think I. I I can say this. My husband once called me um, a beauty treasure hunter, and I loved that. I loved that he said that. And I love that that's, that that's true. And um, I love hunting for treasures. I mean, I love hunting for treasures with my metal detector and my, my, uh, my fishing magnet. I love <laughs> hunting for treasures in the trash. I love hunting for treasures the most in humans. Mm-hmm. In, and I get to do that with photography, right? Yeah. Drawing the beauty out of, out of somebody and, and enjoying them in, in the time that I get to have with them and having an experience with them. Um, but there's really something about, you know, we find what we look for. And when we look for beauty in others, we will find it. In every single human. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So, here's the thing, because this, this is the concept um, I kind of been thinking on through this whole thing. Yeah. Because uh, through all this discussion of creativity and beauty, there's also been uh, sort of your religious beliefs yeah. and all that. How would you say that ties into this? whole lot 
Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> it ties into it a whole lot. Yeah. Because uh, I was just thinking about, I mean, I'm trying to think where I can go with this without sounding too corny. <laughs> sound as corny as you want. Don't worry about how you sound. Because uh, um, there's the concept of what the average person would see as mistakes. Mm. There's, uh, um, I'm getting emotional, damn it. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, beauty out of darkness, all that yeah. stuff. Things that the average person wouldn't see that I think uh, the artist can. Yeah. Did that make sense at all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what I think? I think that God sees beauty in every single person. No matter. Just the fact that they exist. And when we're in touch with God... I believe God puts that in us, puts it in our heart, you know, puts it in our mind and <clears throat> helps us to see things from God's perspective. And, and that's something I really love. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I think that's a good place to end it. So okay. my voice doesn't crack anymore. And uh, okay. I think that wraps it up nicely. <laughs> okay, cool, man. Cool. Th- thank you so much. Is there yeah. anything uh, you'd like to to blog, website, social media, anything like that? Um, yeah. Okay. So my uh, well my website is calenthphotography.com and uh I also would like to plug um uh an organization called Tyler Street Team. Mm-hmm. And um if for for those that are on Facebook um, if you want to, you can go ahead and go into what that is and everything. Yeah, Tyler Street with. Team. Okay. Uh, so, this is going to bring a whole other story, though. That's okay. See, uh, we, is it? we've. Yeah, this is, a, this is a novel. We've closed that All chapter. All right, man. Okay. We've closed right. that chapter. Now we're into this chapter. Okay. All right. So, I'm going to go here then. Um, when I moved into the studio. Downtown, uh, you know, down eight years ago, downtown wasn't happening. Mm-hmm. You know, it was pretty dry, pretty dull down here. Um, other than, you know, Ricks and uh, and Sports Zone, <laughs> that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, excuse me. Um, but, but there's always been, um, a homeless population Mm -hmm. in this part of town. And so when I moved in, uh, those who were, who were living outside in this area wanted to check me out. Who's the new person over here? You know, uh, well, Will she let us use the bathroom? And and of course I was thrilled to meet some new people and and um, and people that people that are that are homeless often have a lot of time on their hands, which means that they're just experiencing life as it comes, seeing what happens next, and they've got all the time in the world. And when I first moved in here, I had all the time in the world, too. And so, so they'd come in, and we'd have coffee together. And we would talk, and I got to know their stories. Because I had a lot of time, and so did they. Yeah. And so they were kind of my first friends, a few of them, down yeah. here. And they'd, they were faithful to come by daily. And uh, anytime I was here, come by, get a cup of coffee, get some water, use the bathroom, and catch up from the day before and and we would talk well during that so I got to know these people and 
and obviously I had a taste in my own life of where they are. And so, so I was able to relate with them a little bit in their situation because I knew what it was like. Not as much as they because I, my bout with homelessness didn't, didn't last as long as, as those that I've, that I've met here mm-hmm. who are chronically homeless. And, and I, uh, so, so then, um, can I start back somewhere else? Why not? I'm going to start back somewhere else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In 2005, when I had my baby and I was living on the campus over at Youth with a Mission, we lived in this dilapidated little single wide trailer home. Mm-hmm. And, and I, and, and, uh, and I loved it. I loved it because I could do whatever I wanted to it. I didn't have to worry about not messing anything up. It was just my little patchwork home, and, and I did whatever I wanted, and I loved it. And I miss it. <laughs> but, um, but I had this baby, and he was really sick. He almost died. And he was just a miracle baby, but I had to keep him safe from the rest of the world. I couldn't let people in the house. I, I couldn't take him out. So I, and I'm an extrovert. I love being around people, but I was stuck at home with this little baby all day by myself. Mm-hmm. And I had come to find out about Craigslist. So while he's sleeping, didn't have, you know, I, I did a lot of art projects. <laughs> it was pretty much everything I did when I wasn't holding the baby. Um, and, but I had spent many years now in, in missions, in service to, to others, to the community, to whatever was in front of me. Um, and I missed that. And one day I was looking on Craigslist and I was just browsing through all the different sections and I found the wanted section. And in the wanted section were things like, uh, and I didn't know anything about Facebook, mm-hmm. right? It like wasn't a thing yet in my world. MySpace was, but uh, I saw things like house burned down, lost everything. We'll take anything that anybody has. Or mm-hmm. we don't have a car and my grandma needs a way to get to her doctor appointments. Can anybody help us with rides? Or I have no money and I need diapers for my baby. Like, so many things. And so in our community of missionaries at YWAM, we had a network. And that was the only real social network that I was really a part of other than MySpace. But I would, say, I, I, I would find these things. So I found this thing, you know, this, uh, for example, this, this uh, somebody was deported. They had to move here. And the cousin that was helping them was really poor. But she found this, this old trailer, but she had nothing to put in it for him. So I put it out on our network of, you know, two, three hundred people in our organization. And I said, hey, these people, these, this woman, her wife got deported. She's got three kids. They're coming here and they've got nothing. And it's almost Christmas. Let's surprise them. So, so people in the organization said, I've got silverware. I've got blankets. And we're all mostly poor. Yeah. But everybody gave something. And we furnished this whole trailer home with everything that you could need with, uh, with gift cards, with ketchup and mustard and salsa and eggs and the whole refrigerator and a Christmas tree with presents for all of the kids and the mom under the tree and bicycles for each kid, all from a community of two to 300 people that were mostly poor because they'd given their lives in service we never got to see them see their house, but we know how blessed they were, you know, when they, when they arrived in town and their, and their cousin said, I've got a place for you to live. And they walked in to fully furnished bedrooms and a living room and even like a TV and a radio and CDs and movies and everything you could ever need. They walked in and it was all theirs, right? I loved it. I loved that I got to do that. And had I not been home with this sick baby, stuck with nothing to do, but find Craigslist, I wouldn't have been <laughs> able to do that. So I became real grateful 
for this new opportunity, this new Craigslist ministry. Then um, there was a man who had leukemia and they couldn't send him home unless his house was like professionally cleaned. So, so I put out, um, on our, on our church bulletin and, and on our YWAM group, and we were able to get a bunch of us volunteers got together and we went over there and we got, uh, we got dry cleaners to help us get the the curtains clean. we got a carpet cleaner to donate his time and we completely cleaned up their whole yard, did everything so that when this old man came home, he was able to be in a clean house and not have to worry about about getting things in order before he passes away or doing his yard because it was all done for him. And um, and so anyway, so it was one thing after another and people yeah. would sign up for rides to drive people. So this became a thing, this Craigslist thing. And it never really went away until I came to know about Facebook. So then there's Facebook and oh my goodness, all I have to do is post something on my Facebook and people will go, I can, I've got that. I can help. So that became a thing. So when I moved in downtown here into the studio, I would meet people and I'd, I'd come to know of their needs. Well, he needs a pair of shoes. His bike is broken. And I could just post it on Facebook. Does anybody have a pair of size 10 shoes with thick soles to keep somebody's feet warm? Does anybody have an extra sleeping bag? Does anybody know how to fix a bike? Yeah. Right? So, so it became, it became a regular thing where I was able to sort of just help these new friends that, that I made by reaching out on Facebook to the community. Well, it grew over time. And, and then, uh, when it was real cold, I could say, does anybody want to help pay for a hotel room for this old man? And people would say, yeah, I'll send you, I got some money out. I'll Apple Pay you, or I'll Venmo you, or I'll Cash App you, and I could go get this hotel room. So if you remember uh, the Snowmageddon, right? Yeah. Snowmageddon happened. <laughs> and, uh, and when you first asked to interview me, I thought that's what you were going to talk to me about. And I was, actually, I was actually relieved you weren't. No, I try, I try um, to know as little as possible. Yeah, I was relieved you weren't, but I also love talking about it, so I'm glad we can throw it in. <laughs> um, and so, so Snowmageddon was happening. It was, uh, what was it? Uh, January, it was, February? Uh, February, it February? February, yeah, yeah. So f- it was February 11th when I first realized it was coming. Yeah. Or 10th, one of those two. And, uh, and there was a friend that I met. His name was Ciro. Ciro. And he was sleeping under the bridge, and he was so cold. And I would just go, I, I, would, I would gather blankets all the time at garage sales, whatever. Mm. I'd even ask people at garage sales, hey, when you're done with this, can I have those blankets? Um, after the sale is over, I'll come pick them up. Because yeah. I like to go cover people up when I see them sleeping outside. Mm-hmm. So I'd go under the bridge, and i just, they're sleeping, and I'd pile blankets on them. <laughs> and, and Ciro was one of those. And, um, and so I thought, oh, they're going to, they might die. Yeah. Like blankets aren't going to be enough this time. Uh, And some of them can't get into the Salvation Army. A lot of them can't get into the Salvation Army. And, and that's the only shelter we've got. Yeah. So, so I put on Facebook, you guys, the, the, the weather's going to be really bad. Some of these people might die. If you'd want to help, you know, I'd love to get, 10 of my friends into hotels. If you want to pay for a, a night for one person, this is how much it is. If you want to pay for a week, this is how much it is. If you want to contribute to a pool, um, please do. Here's my Venmo, Cash App, whatever. Not joking. In just a matter of days, $78,000 came in to my Venmo and, and cash app. Isn't that crazy? 78,000. Yeah. And so I bought out, I bought out the entire super eight and I just went down to my friends and I said, Hey, get in the car. I'm gonna go put you in a hotel. Yeah. You can stay here till this weather, pa- stay there till the weather passes. What? 
you know, coming yeah. out from under the blankets. <laughs> and we just, one by one, we started bringing them. And then like a, like a, um, I put on Facebook, hey, if you've, got a, if you've got a truck or a van and you want to help, please let me know. And we'll tell you where to go. And before, before we knew it, there were people just coming out. We'll go, we've got a truck. We'll go pick, pick, pick people up in the snow. All week long, people were bringing. We, we were able to shelter 177 people that would have otherwise maybe died outside because of the generosity of, of, of the local people. And, um, and so, so I went and, um, and I stayed. I rented a hotel for room for myself. And one of those, yeah. like I rented out the whole super eight and I, and I, and I took one room for myself and they gave me keys. They basically let me take over the whole hotel. They let me answer the phone at the front desk and we set out breakfast and, and the community said, we'll, our, our church group wants to bring lunch. And even some family said, we'll make dinner. How many people we will deliver dinner to the hotel? And we had, we were at six hotels at that time. Different, you know, we had the whole Super 8 and then, uh, uh, you know, a, a spattering of, of rooms and other ones. Yeah. And, um, and because of the community, and so I created this Facebook page called Tyler Street Team. <laughs> Tyler Street Team Volunteers. Yeah. And people just, now there's, I don't know, maybe 2,500, 3,000 people that are on this group now. But um, uh, people, w- we would update throughout the day. We need underwear. We need socks. We need uh, counselors. We've got a domestic violence situation. We need somebody to come for that. We've got so one night. So it was the it was the uh, the second night, second night I think it was, and and I'm pacing back and forth in my room, you know, at like two a.m. and I'm praying, asking God for for like some kind of miraculous idea on how we can how we can make the best of this situation because all these people are going to go back to the street after a week and how can we keep in contact with them? How can we make it so that we can have this be more than just a week? Yeah. So the idea popped into my head at that moment and to, to create, um, uh, an assessment form. And so I contacted path and, and a friend that worked at path and a friend that worked at East Texas human needs networks. And I said, can you send me your assessment forms? And I took their assess- the questions from their assessment forms and I added some of my own uh, questions and made a sheet of it. And I thought, well, everybody's already checked in. Nobody's going to give me these back now. They're just going to think I'm nosy. Yeah. Right? So, but I had all this money. I had so much money. So I had someone go to the bank and get me a wad of $5 bills, just stacks of $5 <laughs> bills. And the next morning at breakfast, I handed out the paper and I said, when you give this back, when you bring this back to me, I'm going to give you $5 cash. Yeah. And so we got over a hundred of them turned back in. And then I asked people, can you come to the volunteers? I mean, we had, I don't know how many volunteers, probably over a hundred throughout the week, just people from the community come volunteer and, and help us. We had so many donations delivered that we took up the entire fitness room <laughs> with um, chips and underwear and feminine products and food and everything you could think of to yeah. help everybody get everything that they needed during that week. And we were able to, and natural grocers donated these bags and we could fill up a bag with, of goodies, gift card, uh, gift, gift certificates to, to Whataburger, everything and passed it out to everybody that had to leave. Like, we're sorry, it's time to go after this week, but here's a goodie bag for you. Yeah. There's some good things in there. And we had all of their information most of them told us where they were sleeping and so that we were able to go visit them and check up on them, things like that, right? Yeah. So at the end of the week, I had a bunch of money still left over. I can't remember how much it was, but I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to say it was over $20,000, perhaps thirty. I don't remember. There was still a lot of money left. There was still a lot in that fitness room um, left over. Oh, and there were also... The other, the, another cool thing is, is one of the questions I had on there was, would you like someone to pray with you? And almost everybody said yes. Yeah. And so, um, so, so I put on the Facebook, uh, you know, if you are uh, someone who prays, if you're a pastor or anything, if you want to come, we have people that would like prayer. And so I gave them the room numbers, and they just went door to door 
to the rooms that asked for prayer and went in their rooms and spent time with them and prayed with them. And um, some people formed relationships with those people. UT uh, came, they sent a team of doctors and the doctors went room to room for those that needed medical care and gave antibiotics and bound up people's wounds. And some, there was one guy who was dying that um, got to go to the emergency room and now he's in a nursing home and he's, he doesn't have to be homeless anymore. You know? So there were, there were a number of people that went straight from the hotel to, um, to the hospital, to nursing homes, to rehab centers, to um, uh, uh, other programs and didn't have to go back to the street. And all as a result of this crazy storm, this, ama- this like insane storm that caused so much damage also gave, gave us the opportunity to save some lives yeah. and to change some lives forever. So at the end of this, I had all this money. My father-in-law is a CPA and he said, you can't just, you can't just keep all that money and do, you know, help whoever you want, whenever you want with it. Like you got to be accountable for this. And I said, why do I do that? And he said, you got you to gotta become a 501c3. You got to, you gotta, uh, if you're going to keep, you know, helping people and accepting money, you've got to go put this in the bank. You can't just, you know, yeah. and create a separate account for it. I said, okay. And I did everything you told me to do. And, and a lawyer said, hey, I can come help you with all this. So, so we created this organization, me and the, and the eight to eight, nine other volunteers that did the most work that week we created this organization and and uh, in the middle of the night you know that like one night I said all right I'm just going to make this page to get you know for people to communicate with we'll call it Tyler Street Team and um so so then I'm I'm suddenly the director of an organization and I am not a director I am not that girl so I'm like at that same time, you know, one of my midnight talks with God, I'm saying, God, I don't want to be the organiz- I don't want to be an organization leader. I don't want to be the director of something. I'm really good at loving the person in front of me, and that's what I want to do. And so I felt at that moment that it was like being a birth mother, that I was, you know, like I accidentally got pregnant with this baby that I can't take care of, and I just need to be a good steward of this creation. Mm-hmm which was the Tyler Street team, until I could find uh, another entity or another person that could carry it on. And so I carried it for six months. And then, uh, and then the team that, that, uh, that had come together that week said, you know, they basically released me and said, we understand. Yeah. You know, I'm running a whole business. And I've got all these friends with high needs. And I can't <laughs> be in charge of any organization, even though I, you know was there in the foundation of it. I, I can't keep it going. So, so that was over a year ago. And, uh, and I stepped down from any kind of leadership role. And now I, I, I'm a volunteer of this organization. Yeah. And, um, and it's called Tyler Street Team. So just go to the Facebook and page. Go to the Facebook page and join Tyler Street Team Volunteers. Okay. And I'll definitely for, link it. Okay, in the video yeah. And, and if there are people who want to get more involved... Um, on a daily basis or a, or a as as your able basis, um, you can go um, you can contact uh, there's a phone number, an emergency number that's nine zero three two five three zero three zero one. And you can call and leave a message there that you want to be part of the boots on the ground team. And the boots on the ground team is are the daily people that get a, a WhatsApp message saying, there's somebody over at 7-Eleven right now and they're cold and they're standing out there and they're having a mental breakdown or whatever. Yeah. And the people in the boots on the ground team can go, I'll go. Yeah. It's 2 a.m., but I'll go over there and I'll go. And, and, and the whole goal of this team was to facilitate, was not to create another organization, but to, to originally my goal was to facilitate um, – a culture within the city of Tyler where people love their neighbor. Yeah. You don't call a phone number and tell an organization to take care of them. You become, you, you go and you get on that volunteer page and you become one of them Yeah. and you carry things in your trunk. You carry blankets, 
You carry rain jackets and umbrellas and water and, and disposable hand warmers. You carry them with you, and when you see somebody, you pull over. And maybe you give them a hug, or you pray for them, or you give them these things, or you have little resources, and you, you let them know where they need to go, and you drive them there. Or if you don't feel comfortable driving, then you contact the Boots on the Ground team and ask somebody who does feel comfortable to go give them a ride to the shelter. So um, so uh, tylerstreetteam.org is the website. Tyler Street Team Volunteers is the, the volunteer Facebook page. Okay. I'll definitely link all that. Awesome. Thank you so much for... Uh, Thank you. Everything, for sharing your story, for sharing your ideas, for... I mean, starting that organization and everything. That's really beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hey there. Look at you. You made it to the end. You're a pretty unordinary person yourself. Most people don't do that. Uh, While you're here, why don't you like and subscribe or follow or whatever it is. Oh, also, we're on Instagram and Facebook. So, you should probably go check those out too. Thanks for listening. You're pretty cool.